Goins takes the reader into the violent world of ghetto prostitution. Horson Jones, the novel's hero, or anti-hero as I like to say, is the son of a beautiful black prostitute and an unknown white John. By the age of 16, he is a full-fledged pimp. Cold-blooded and ruthless. Written in gritty street talk, Horson's story affords a startling glimpse into the hell of the inner city, yet bristles with bitter humor and defiant pride. Chuden Duch And welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On this edition of Ralph Reads, I will bring this miniseries to a close with the grand finale of Horson, written by the one and only Donald Goins. Let us not waste any more time. Let the reading commence. Chapter 24 it was a clear starlit night. Most of the traffic was gone. It was that in-between hour of the evening. When I got downtown, Stella was standing in front of Hudson's department store. When I blew my horn, she came running over, her black silk dress hugging her hips provocatively. Her eyes sparkled at the sight of me. Oh, Johnny, I was so worried you changed your mind. She stepped into the car, displaying more class than I was accustomed to. I let my eyes run up and down her body slowly. It made her happy when I looked at her like that. She knew she was getting old, so I guess she figured she was losing her looks. The dress brought out her complexion, though, and when she smiled, it made her look ten years younger. We stopped and had dinner at Harry's Supper Club before continuing on our way. When I pulled up in front of the church, I saw by my watch that I was two minutes early. I pulled her to me and kissed her. She complained happily. Stop, Johnny. You're going to mess up my makeup. When a woman is really in love, she looks desirable. Or maybe it was just the $20,000 I was about to get. Whatever it was, something made her look very good that night. I got out of the car and opened the door for her. She smiled her appreciation as she got out. It's so easy to make a woman in love happy. We walked into the church, hugged up tightly together. She was lying in my arm as though she had been made there. Preacher had to wave frantically at the organ player to stop him from belting out one of Jimmy Smith's latest numbers. Stella was too far gone to notice. The people sitting around the church played their parts well. Most of them were too drunk to know what was going on, while others thought it was the real deal going down. I glanced around and noticed one winehead holding his woman in her chair. She was too drunk to sit up by herself. I held my breath, prayed that it would end in a hurry, and rushed Stella towards the front of the church. If Stella had been black, she would have been hip immediately, but she had never been in a black church before, so whatever she saw was bound to look strange. The organ player began to play Here Comes the Bride. I stared at Preacher, hoping like hell he would hurry. My stomach flipped over on me as though I was standing in front of a judge getting ready to be sentenced on first degree. Preacher mumbled out the words and I managed to get my yeses in at the right place. As soon as it was over, I kissed the bride. I let out a sigh of relief. One drunk came up and tried to kiss the bride, but I pushed him away. I didn't give a damn about him kissing her. I just didn't want her to smell that goddamn booze on his breath. I handed Preacher a fat envelope. Here you go, Rev. I said, maybe this will help you get a larger church. He grinned and accepted the sealed envelope. Good luck to both of you happy people. May you get what you both hope for.
Stella was beaming with happiness. Thank you, sir, she replied sweetly. Her face was full of joy, and for a moment, I hated myself for the low-down trick I was getting ready to put on her. I glanced over my shoulder and saw one of the drunk-ass bitches trying to do a striptease. I damn near shit on myself until I saw someone pull her back down to her seat. After that, I didn't waste any time getting the hell out of there with Stella. She seemed to enjoy my dilemma. When we got outside, she acted like she wanted to go back in. All I want to do is thank all the nice people for showing up, she said happily. The hell with the nice people, I replied quickly. They would have been here anyway. It's a church night. Again, I held the door for her while she got in. A little more kindness wouldn't hurt a thing this late in the game. She gave me directions as I drove. When we got to the suburbs, it was like another world to me. No broken down houses staring you in the face. Everything neat and clean. The streets unlittered with tricks, accosting every woman that walked past. Yes, Stella, I thought coldly. You're going to pave the way so that I'll never have to live in another slum again. From here on out, it will be penthouses with the best of everything tossed in. I had experienced enough filth and poverty to last me four lifetimes. When I pulled up in her driveway, I could see that her house was in the $50,000 bracket. It was far more than just a modern ranch type home with a beautiful lawn. There was enough room on her property to hold 10 inner city homes with room to spare. The inside of the house turned out to be just as beautiful. Wall-to-wall -wall carpet, rooms big enough for a man to really live in. I felt good at the thought of all this being mine now, if I wanted it. But I had my cap set for bigger prey. This was just the beginning. Stella was just one more woman for me to use on my way to the top. Right then, I came face to face with myself. I didn't care for no one woman, black or white. They were all just stepping stones. Life had begun a giant jungle for me in which the coldest, most brutal animal won. To fight your way out of the quicksand of the slums, you had to be ruthless. Maybe Preacher was right when he said I was a man caught between two races with neither one wanting me. If so, I didn't give a damn. I didn't need to be anyone or anything but me. Stella had everything prepared. Here, honey, she said, and held out a champagne bottle for me to open. I took a towel and wrapped it around the cap and opened it without a pop. We drank up the bottle, then moved to something a little stronger. I rolled up some weed and gave her a joint. The weed on top of the whiskey lit her up. Before she got too high, she grinned at me and got up. Here, honey, I want you to see I'm holding up my end of the deal. She got up and staggered towards the bedroom. I followed her and watched closely as she opened up her wall safe. She flashed the money at me, then started to close it back up. Wait a minute, baby, I said quickly. That's mine, ain't it? She nodded drunkenly. I removed the money and set it on the bed. It was the first time in my life I had ever seen so much money. I slowly counted it while she staggered out to refill our drinks. When she returned, I was drunk on power. Green power. I stacked the money on a dresser. Stella now wore only her slip. I caught her around the waist. If I hadn't known myself so well, I would have sworn I was in love. I pushed her down on the bed and pulled one of her straps loose, revealing one of her beautiful pink tits. I put my mouth over it and slowly ran my tongue up and down on the nipple until it became hard. I could feel my penis rearing like it was about to bust out of my pants. The money had excited me more than anything else in my life. I mounted her with my pants still on and rammed myself down into her. She caught her breath quickly, but loved it all at the same time. 
I took her roughly, pounding up and down in her until she moaned. When she reached up for me, I clutched her tightly in my arms and gave her the best $20,000 fuck I had ever given. We lay beside each other, breathing heavily. Soon, her light snore came to me. I rolled over and stared down at her face. Gently, I kissed her cheek. I really liked Stella, but I couldn't allow my emotions to come between me and the bright lights. Playing heavy game was part of nature. I washed up, then came back and picked my money up and took it into the front room. I counted it again. When I finished, I wrote Stella a brief note, trying to say goodbye as gently as possible. This one small act of kindness was ruined for me as I thought of her waking up in the morning alone. When she found out, she had lost her one opportunity to satisfy her sex drive and that that one fuck had cost her 20 grand, she would be one mad bitch. As I walked out the front door, uncontrollable laughter escaped from me, mocking laughter filled with bitterness and hate. After locking the money in my car trunk, I went back to the motel. I was filled with an intoxicating drug, stronger than drink, more pleasing than drugs, the ripening fruit of greed. If Boots was still at the motel, she would really find out what payback was all about. Boots met me at the door. Get your bag, whore. I'm ready to ride out. Joy leapt in her eyes. She ran back in the room and came out with her bags and mine. I peeled rubber as I left the motel parking lot. Life was beginning to look sweeter and sweeter. I drove out to the city limits and pulled up in an all-night gas station to get the tank filled. While waiting, I made a phone call to Tony. One of his girls answered the phone. Honey, I said he was taking a bath and I don't think he wants to be disturbed. Her voice was low and polite. Bitch! I snarled into the receiver. You tell him that this is whore son on the phone. I could hear her relaying the message to someone else in the room. Almost instantly, Tony's angry voice came over the line. Whore son, dig baby, don't play games with me. Before I could answer, he rushed on. Listen man, I don't give a fuck about that whore, but I do want you to return my money. You understand what I'm talking about? I can dig where you're coming from baby, but having that funky bitch steal my bread is going too far. I laughed loudly. I just called Tony to find out if you knew payback when you saw it. As you know, baby, the game ain't cop and blow. It's cop, block, and lock. I waited until he quit cursing. Then I done blocked your game, copped your whore, and locked up your gold. Can you dig it, baby? Can you dig it, player? His voice was deadly as he replied, but I ignored him and continued to laugh. All that shit about killing the bitch when you catch her is bullshit. Though, I couldn't care less what you did to her. I just wanted you to really know, Tony, that I repaid you for what you did to me. And you can rest easy on the bitch's account, because I'm going to fix her little red wagon too. I ain't gonna never forget this! He yelled wildly, then his voice changed and he begged, Just bring me my money back, whore son. That's all I want. I don't want you to ever forget it, Tony. And I don't want you to ever forget that I'm the one who did it to you, baby. I said harshly and slammed the phone down on him. When I reached the car, Boots smiled hesitantly. That was Tony, wasn't it? She asked, a tremor in her voice revealing her fright. He just got a taste of payback, baby, I replied as I started the car up. I gave the gas station attendant his money and pulled away from the pump. The stars were still bright as I hit the highway for New York. We drove most of the way in silence. Boots attempted to make small conversation, but I ignored her, so she cuddled up in the seat and tried to sleep. When morning came, I was almost there. I kept my foot in the gas tank, eating up the miles. It was noon when I finally reached New York. 
As soon as I got past the city limits and off the freeway, I pulled over to the curb. Boots stared at me in surprise when I stopped. This is the end of the road for you, bitch, I stated brutally. For a brief second, she just stared at me, too dumbfounded to understand what I meant. What you mean? What you talking about, daddy? She stared around at the unfamiliar city. Honey, you don't expect me to get out here. Her features were frozen with disbelief. She stared more closely to see if I were joking. Horson, you wouldn't do this to me, would you? For an answer, I reached across her and opened the door. It ain't about nothing, bitch, I replied. Just a little payback. She shook her head mutely. She fumbled with her tiny purse and held it under my nose. I ain't got a penny, horse son. I gave you every penny I had in this world, man. Her eyes filled with tears. I'm asking you to please don't do this to me, horse son. Her voice was broken as she continued. I don't know a soul in this goddamn city, man, and ain't got a dime to make a phone call with. I laughed mockingly in her face. You don't know how sweet that is to my ears, Boots. The only regret I got now is that you ain't covered with gasoline so I can have the pleasure of tossing a match on your funky ass. She stared at me, fighting for control. Then you really mean to keep all that money that I gave you? You ain't gonna give me none of it. Not even enough to rent me a room so I can work out of it and get myself together. Her voice was beginning to get firmer to take on a frosty chill I should have paid heed to. A room, I laughed. Bitch, if you could buy a house for one nickel and had to get it from me, you wouldn't have enough to buy the doorknob on that back door. She didn't bother to answer. She reached over the seat and got her bags. She tossed them out on the ground, then leaned over and spit. Before I could react, she jumped out of the car. I removed my pocket handkerchief and wiped my face. As far as I was concerned, I had come out on top. I watched her in my mirror as I pulled away, standing on the curb, staring after me, her hands on her hips, until I lost her from sight. Chapter 25 The wind rattled my windows and I cursed this New York weather. I rolled over in the bed and sat up. I shook my head to shake off the fuzziness. I had been in New York for over a week now, and ever since I had gotten in touch with Janet, it had been one merry-go-round. I lit up a cigarette and thought about her. She was playing one of the most expensive nightclubs in the city now, and some of the people I had met through her had really been big stuff. I grinned to myself as I remembered the way she always introduced me, Mr. W.S. Jones. She was afraid to tell him my first name, but that was understandable. In the circle of white people she moved in, my name would really start some gossip. Even so, I could see some of the more experienced men staring at me closely at times. I knew that they were trying to figure just what the hell the deal was with me. I smiled. Just the thought of the 25 grand I had put in the bank made me feel legitimate as hell. The phone rang suddenly. Hi, honey. Are you awake yet? Her sweet laughter came tingling along the line. Hell no! I'm dreaming that Janet just called me and wanted to know if she could come up to my apartment and wake me up properly. Horson, dear, I really do wish I could come up, but I know that once you get me into that apartment, you never will behave yourself. So I think I'll take a few precautions, like having you meet me uptown for lunch. Can you make it? It depends on what time you're having lunch, I replied, glancing at my watch. Since it's after two o'clock now, wouldn't it have been better to just say supper? Her rich laughter came through the phone again. I was beginning to really enjoy myself with her. Janet was the first woman I had ever dated without having in the back of my mind to beat her out of something. Since I had reached her after arriving in New York, I had experienced some truly shocking changes in my life. I didn't have to worry about my phone calls in the middle of the night telling me my woman was in jail or the hospital, so I had begun to relax. 
For the past few days, I have been wondering more and more what I could invest my money in. Something legitimate for a change. Say in about a half hour, honey, wouldn't that give you enough time to get up and get ready? She asked sweetly. More than enough, Janet. I hesitated briefly. Listen, sugar, can't we go somewhere besides those expensive places you like to go to? No, it isn't the money I'm worried about, I said quickly, cutting off her question. I just don't feel comfortable when I'm sitting in Sardis. That was really an understatement. When I went to places like that with her, I felt like a lackey. I felt everyone could look through me and see I didn't belong. I'll tell you what, Horson. I'll meet you in the lobby of your hotel in a half an hour. Then you can choose wherever you like. Honey, I said, trying one more time. If you're coming this far, you might as well come upstairs and help me dress. Don't forget, half an hour, she said and hung up, not even bothering to answer my question. Again, I wondered if it could be possible for Janet to be a virgin. I would have known if she was fucking when we grew up. There had never been any wire out on her making it with anyone, but you never could tell about those things. Since she was in show business, I couldn't imagine all the men she came in contact with not being able to get her pants off. No, someone somewhere had to have copped. I'd find out in the near future, I promised myself. I took a quick shower and dressed carefully, putting on a sky blue silk suit with dark blue matching suede shoes. It was chilly out, so I draped my fall coat over the arm of a chair while I lit up a joint. I had just about finished smoking it when she called from the lobby. I didn't even bother to try to get her to come upstairs. Everything would come to the man with patience. I grabbed my coat and hurried down the lobby. She was standing against the desk when I got there. She was still thin, with large, lovely eyes. I looked at her with affection. Two young ladies sitting in the lobby stared at her openly. I believe they recognized her, but hadn't made up their minds if it was Janet or not. I rushed her out of the hotel and into my car. I removed the ticket from off the windshield. If I don't start paying these goddamn things soon, I said as we got in the car, I'll have enough of them to start a motherfucking collection. She turned to me and smiled. I know you don't like to eat at some of the places I go, Horson, but I've got an appointment with some people at Harry's Supper Lounge. I couldn't keep the irritation out of my voice. I guess it doesn't make too much difference, Janet. Honey, I didn't mean for this to happen, but before I left my place, they called, and since it was important, I decided to have them meet us. She continued to explain. One of the men we're meeting happens to own a booking agency, so I thought you might want to meet him. She added quickly, you know these are the kind of people you're going to have to know, whore son, if you want to make it in any part of show business. For a while, I remained silent, thinking over what she had said. You know, all I'm really thinking about opening is a small record company, Janet. To these people you talk to, that's small peanuts. I hate to give them the impression you're wasting your time with someone who's still on the ground floor. Once again, I was filled with that feeling of insecurity. I wondered if I was that far out of my depth. She reached over and clutched my arm reassuringly. Don't worry about it, honey. They're nothing but flesh and bones. You came out of the slums, whore son. Here you are, not even 25 yet, with money in the bank. Why? All you have to do is pick out a field you like, and you're young enough to learn by your mistakes. By the time you reach 30, you'll have a full knowledge of what you're doing. She smiled at me and continued. Most of the people you'll meet will be men and women just like yourself. People who wouldn't believe that all life had to offer them was a small paying job in someone else's office or plant. They had ambition and confidence in themselves and that's why they're where they're at today. A doorman opened the car door for us when I pulled up in front of the place. My knees trembled slightly. It was another world to me, but I knew I was buying chips in the game and I planned on playing my hand to a T. I got out and we walked inside the club. The head waiter knew Janet on sight. He led us to a table where three men and one woman were already sitting. 
The men stood up as we approached. Janet introduced me to the men and I shook hands with all of them, then nodded slightly towards the woman. One of the men pulled Janet's chair out and held it for her as we sat down. I gritted my teeth, wishing I had thought of doing it first. Once or twice, I caught the woman's eyes on me, appraising me openly. She was in her early thirties and had sharp, keen features. Her eyes were pale green that matched the flaming red hair she wore in a huge beehive. I wondered idly if it was really her hair or a dye job. Janet, dear, you're just going to have to tell me where you found this beautiful specimen of a man. Just look at him, she exclaimed as I blushed. He even blushes beautifully. The men around the table laughed. I put on my most charming smile, hoping it would cover up my embarrassment. You won't have to worry about Martha now, Mr. Jones, the young man who had been introduced as Ringo said. If she likes you, she won't write anything nasty about you in her column. I stared closely at the blonde young man they called Ringo. Something about his name had rung a bell in the back of my mind, but because of my nervousness, I couldn't put a finger on it. Don't worry about anything Ringo has to say, darling, she replied, patting my arm affectionately. He's probably still carrying the grudge over the loss of Janet. You already know, don't you, darling, that Janet and Ringo were engaged to take the big jump. She smiled brightly at everyone at the table, but I hadn't missed the bright glitter in her eyes as she told the old news. She watched for my reaction, but I was beginning to get on firm ground now. I was used to the sharp claws of malicious women. Yes, I replied cheerfully. Janet told me earlier that Mr. Ringo would be here. I have been aware of him, but I haven't had the opportunity to meet him until today. I glanced up at Janet and saw the relief in her eyes. After that, the conversation became more formal. They discussed the idea of having Janet and Ringo go on a three-month tour of the West Coast after she completed her bookings in the East. I could tell from the look in Ringo's eye that he was all for the tour. He and Janet had the same agent and the agent was all for that trip. It wasn't hard for my inexperienced mind to grasp what was behind the scheme. Ringo hadn't had a record in the top 100 in the past two years. With Janet drawing the crowd, they would be able to cash in on the rumors about their past romance, plus rebuild his image. Ringo was hungry. I watched his cold blue eyes search Janet's face. She kept her eyes away from him. She was up on what was going down. She glanced at me shyly. I shook my head, wanting her to know I didn't want her going for the deal at all. Martha caught my motion and smiled. Mr. Jones, I believe you might have a surprise for a lot of people in this town. I grinned at her in return, staring into her eyes until she looked away. I wanted her to know that I was a man and not some woman's play toy. I decided to put all my marbles in the pot at once. When a man has dealt with women all his life, he has a feeling about them that is seldom wrong. I knew that many women were slow to make a decision, but if you backed them in the corner, they would accept it. I decided to put Janet in that corner. I really didn't have that much to lose. Either she went for it, or I started to pimp everything that wore a skirt in New York. I don't think Janet will be able to accept that offer. I began and waited until I was sure I had everyone's attention. Because we are getting married next month. Just like that, I laid it on the table. Everything was hanging out. Janet's mouth dropped open and she looked like she was having trouble breathing. Martha was the first one to regain her composure. Is that right? Is that correct, Janet? Can I quote you on that? Her questions were sharp and to the point. Janet nodded her head in agreement and continued to stare at me in utter shock. Martha jumped up and ran to the phone. The gray-headed agent ordered a round of drinks for everyone while Ringo shot daggers across the table at me. 
I return to stare. Up your ass, Pecklewood, I said to myself coldly. This was one little black girl you gray boys wouldn't get a chance to play out of a million. When Martha returned, we had a few more drinks, then got ready to go. When Janet got up and came around the table, I took her arm. I began to steer her towards the door. Before I could react, a flashbulb went off in my face. I jerked my head back, but it was too late. The damage had been done. I stared angrily after the girl with the camera. What's wrong, Mr. Jones? A man as handsome as you are shouldn't mind someone taking your picture, Martha said lightly. Besides, I want Janet's fans to see the wonderful specimen she has managed to latch onto. Outside the club, we shook hands again. Then I managed to get Janet away and into my car. We rode in silence for a few blocks. Why did you do that, horse son? She asked slowly. Why? I don't know why you even bothered to ask me something like that, woman. Unless you were interested in making that tour with that high-paid pimp. I replied, fighting for time to get my answers together. You don't have to call Ringo any names, Orson. And it sure wasn't necessary for you to go and put your foot in your mouth like that, she replied. The anger was coming now. If you didn't like the idea, why didn't you just tell your lily white friends that I was lying? If I could get her on the defensive, I reasoned, I had a good chance of winning more than I had bargained for. Even though I had mentioned marriage on the spur of the moment, I was by no means a fool. I knew marriage to Janet would put me on easy street for a long time. First of all, Horson, I didn't want to make a fool out of you by denying it. If you had asked me about it, I would have probably agreed to marrying you anyway. But this way, you make me feel as though you're playing on me. She glanced up at me and her eyes were filled with tears. Playing on you, hell, I replied sharply. Was pretty Ringo playing on you when they tried to get you to go on that goddamn tour? I could have handled that myself, she explained softly. Anyway, it's understandable. Ringo wanted to marry me and still does for that matter. Why shouldn't he want to go on a tour with me? He probably thinks it will help his chances out. Marry you, my black ass. You black bitches kill me. Every time one of you gets a little bit of money and a white man looks at you, you really think he wants to marry you. Bullshit! All he wants to do is play you out of that cash. I reached over and pulled the car shade down so she could see herself in the little mirror on the back. Look in that and tell me what you see. No, that's all right. I'll tell you what you'll see. A black woman. Not the most beautiful black woman in the world either. Just a young, cute black girl. Now, not counting all the fine-ass white girls out there, let's talk about the fine-ass black ones. I stopped and caught my breath. Wherever Mr. Ringo sings at, you can bet money there's some pretty, not cute, but pretty, beautiful black girls in the audience listening. And some of them girls would jump out of a 10-story window just to be able to carry Mr. Ringo's shorts. Yet, you don't find him taking any of them home to mama, do you? You bet your goddamn ass you don't, I stated, not giving her time to answer. I pulled up in front of my hotel and parked. I want you to come upstairs for a minute. I got something I want to show you. Without waiting for her answer, I got out and walked towards the entrance. She followed meekly behind me. We remained silent until we got out of the elevator on the fourth floor and entered my apartment. I don't see any difference, Horson, in you or Ringo. You say he wants to marry me because of my money, but I'm supposed to believe the only reason you want me is because of my just fair looks, as you put it. Sarcasm dripped from her words. You may not know it, she continued, but Ringo happens to be Jewish, so he knows all about being discriminated against. I happen to know he came from a poor background the same as I did. You better damn well bet he did, I said harshly. 
Let me tell you something, little mixed up fool. When I was in prison, I learned something about white folks, and Jews in particular. Dig this first, baby, I said, waving her quiet. Out of all of the old phase in prison, the only ones I wouldn't mess with were the Jews, baby. And you know why? Well, I'll tell you. A poor Jew catches damn near as much hell as a black man in this country, honey. You hear me? If he goes south, they might beat his goddamn ass if them hillbillies feel like it. You know what I mean? I stared at her closely, then continued. That's why I say this. When the poor Jew starts climbing, baby, he knows he has one strike against him already. You dig? Just because he's a Jew. Now, I want you to look me in the eye and tell me, do you really believe a young Jew boy who was raised in a cold water flat, rats running all over the motherfucking place, will intentionally go all out of his way to marry a woman with two strikes against her? Not one, like he got, but two. Do you really believe he would? I stared at her as though she was losing her mind. She held her head and staggered over to the couch and sat down. I just don't know, Horson. I really don't. What you say may be true, and then again it may not. She dropped her head. Okay then, baby. Just think about this and try to answer it for me. I went on, realizing I had her going. If you think I'm lying, why don't you go with me this evening and I'll show you damn near every white boy we see who's really pimping. And I mean pimping with white girls and black ones is Jewish. I stared at her intently. I had just told her one of the damnedest lies. If she asked me to prove it, I didn't have the faintest idea where to find any white pimps at, let alone any Jewish ones. She jumped up and ran over and hit me in the chest with her small fists. I don't care, she screamed. You're no better. All you want me for is my money too. She was crying and screaming. I grabbed her arm and pulled her into the bedroom. I held her as I opened up the dresser drawer and removed my bank book. I pushed her on the bed and tossed it in her lap. She stared at it dumbly. Open it, goddamn you! I screamed. I should have gotten an Oscar for my acting ability. I grabbed her and opened the book, making her see where I had close to $25,000 in the bank. She stared at the figures, not really believing her own eyes. The tears stopped flowing as she tried to understand what she was seeing. She had known I had money in the bank, but by no stretch of the imagination would she have believed such a large figure. Now, do you still believe I want you just for your money? I asked slowly. I sat down and pulled her in my arms. She was still shook up. But... But, whore son, she managed to say before I interrupted. But, but, hell, I said and kissed her. It's your choice now, baby. Either you want a black man, or it's really true that you done got color struck and you won't be satisfied until you get your own white owl. I was dealing them at her now from the bottom of the deck, and I didn't believe she was fast enough to catch on. She tried to deny it. Whore son, you know that ain't true. Prove it, baby, I said flatly and pushed her back on the bed. Before she realized it, I had her out of her blouse and was working on her skirt. I kissed her around the neck as she tried to stop my searching hands. Please, Horson, please, not like this, she managed to say. I found the zipper on her skirt and opened the button over it. With one smooth motion, I removed skirt and half slip. She glanced down at her self-surprise. I had her undressed down to her panties and bra. Stop, Horson, stop! She started to squirm, but I pinned one of her arms behind her head while lying on the other one. Without allowing her time to think, I pushed one side of her bra up and stared down at her one small breast. Quickly, I covered it with my mouth, slowly releasing her arm as I felt her struggles cease. Please, horse son, please, don't do this to me, not like this. Her pleading was in vain. I could feel her hand on the back of my head as I slowly ran my tongue around her tiny nipple, making it harden. Her breathing became louder and louder. I removed her pants slowly, kissing her navel as I went down. 
She tried to close her legs, but it was only her last resort against the inevitable. When I mounted her, I had to force an entry because of her tightness. She cried out in pain. I kissed the salty teardrops from her eyelids as the wonderful discovery of her virginity dawned on me. Later, I made love to her slowly and tenderly, helping her over her awkwardness until she finally realized the beauty of lovemaking. She lay in my arms, cuddled up tightly, happy and satisfied. As I lay back and stared at the ceiling, a feeling of tenderness came over me. For once in my life, I knew the meaning of the word love. Chapter 26 Across town in a small, dingy hotel room, Boots stared at the ceiling too, but her thoughts were not of love and tenderness. She was remembering the harshness of the treatment she had received when she arrived in the big city. It had become like a growing cancer in her mind. No matter how much she drank, her mind came back to that morning. Never in her life had she felt so rejected. No man had ever managed to make her feel so low. Only one thing kept her in this cold city, and that was the thought of revenge. At no time did she ever doubt her ability to revenge the wrong done to her. The only problem was how. She blushed as she remembered how she had broken down and cried inside the car of the man who had stopped to pick her up. He had been an elderly white man with glasses, and he had watched her silently for a few minutes after she had blurted out like a young schoolgirl how she was stranded in New York without any money he had offered her train fare home. She had refused the fare, but had accepted $10 so she could get a room. He had refused to come up when he let her out. It was one of the few kind things she had ever had done for her. She would have liked to have been able to return his $10, but he didn't leave an address. He told her to accept it as a gift and not to worry about it. He had blushed when she leaned over and kissed him on the cheek. How beautiful life would have been, she thought at the moment, if her father had been any way like that kind and gentle, and most of all, understanding. Boots dressed slowly. She tried to remember the good time she had with whore son, but it didn't do any good. Her mind was firmly made up. She stared at the open newspaper again. There he was, big as life, holding Janet. Well, Mr. Whore son, she said loudly to the empty room, you have a few surprises coming to you, my friend, quite a few surprises. The bar was dimly lit when she entered it. She stared at the few male customers sitting around on the bar stools. Only one of the men had taken any interest in her as she walked across the floor. The rest continued to stare in their drinks. She walked past the bar and joined two women sitting in the rear at a table. They glanced up at her as she approached. She smiled at the two young black prostitutes as she joined their table. One of them was a lesbian, and the other one belonged to the lesbian. The lesbian stared at Boots coldly. Ever since Boots had started working out of their bar, she had been trying to figure her out. The first night she had come in, the lesbian had spent $10 with her, hoping to cop another girl. But to her surprise, she quickly found out that Boots was just as experienced in the art of making love to another woman as she was. Boots could take either the top or bottom without the least show of emotion. She could sense something hard about this young hustler out of Detroit, and she didn't want to bring it to the surface. Most of the other women who worked out of the bar gave her plenty room. They didn't care to become involved in any arguments with her, but Boots, on the other hand, would quickly come out and tell her she was full of shit, then laugh at her harshly. Boots sat down without waiting for anyone to invite her. Hi, Billy dear, she said, smiling at the lesbian. Billy managed to smile back and glanced out of the corner of her eye at her girl, Anne, who was staring at Boots in fascination. She was quick to notice the byplay that always started between Billy and Boots. She remembered the night when Billy was busy. She had approached Boots and let her know that she might be interested in changing pimps. Boots had laughed at her and told her she wasn't a lesbian. Anne stared openly at the tall, dark-skinned woman who aroused her so much. Her avid interest was not missed by Billy. 
Then, she said sharply, you run down to Lee's bar and see if any tricks are there. Anne started to object, but Billy reached across the table and slapped her. The sound was like a shot going off in a small place. People turned and stared as Anne jumped up and ran out of the bar. Billy stared coldly at Boots. There was a look in her eyes that said, If you have any objection, spit it out. She's young yet, Billy said quietly. She has a lot to learn. Don't blow your whore over me, Billy, Boots said coldly. I wouldn't have her if you gave her to me, so don't push it. I just don't understand you, Billy said, laughing to cover up her confusion. Boots, I ain't never seen no bitch in my life that acted like you do. What do you want? I want a yellow nigga's ass locked up so long he'll have cobwebs on his dick by the time he gets out. Boots answered. Her voice trembled. Billy glanced at her nervously, then said jokingly, If that's all you want, you ain't got too much of a problem. There's a detective sitting at the end of the bar now, trying to catch some poor whore for soliciting. Boots glanced up at the young detective at the end of the bar. Something clicked in her mind. She smiled coldly and got up. The chilling look in her eye made Billy even more nervous. She watched Boots make her way across the bar floor towards the policeman. Hi there, Boots said, and stopped beside the officer. He glanced up at her and smiled. His eyes were a mild brown, and he wore his short brown hair in a crew cut. What can I do for you, young lady? He asked easily. How much money you want to spend? He stared at her curiously. There was a brightness in her eyes that made him wonder whether she was on dope or something. What about ten dollars? He asked slowly, watching her face. She glanced over his shoulder and saw the bartender shaking his head at her. That will be just fine, she answered and started walking towards the door. The policeman caught up with her and when they reached the street, he flashed his badge. You're under arrest for accosting and soliciting, he informed her. She smiled over her shoulder at him and never broke step. That's just fine with me, she replied, then asked, Do you think I might be able to get the charges dropped if I give up my pimp? The officer's heart skipped a beat. He wondered if he had heard that correctly. It was rare for a prostitute to even admit she had a pimp, let alone propose dropping her charges if she busted her man. If we can get a case on him, I'm sure we can work something out in your favor, he answered. Boots smiled coldly. It didn't really make any difference whether they dropped the charges on her or not. The main thing was racking up whore son's goddamn ass. Chapter 27 I walked out of my apartment, stopped, and inhaled deeply. You could smell the coming of winter. I smiled to myself. 1965 had the outlook of being a beautiful year, I thought. If we got married before Christmas, we could spend the rest of the winter on the West Coast. The first part of next year, I'd go into the business end of show business. There was no doubt in my mind any longer as to whether I could make out. It was just a matter of playing for bigger stakes. My car was kind of slow starting, and I decided I'd have it checked the first chance I got. I drove slowly uptown. Janet would be waiting for me at her apartment. It was one of those days when I believed that I had the world in my back pocket. I parked in front of her hotel and smiled condescendingly at the doorman. He smiled politely and held the door open. This was something I was getting used to, and it was really sweet. The bell captain smiled and nodded politely at me. I was getting to be known by sight from all the times I had come in with Janet. The thick carpet sank under my feet as I crossed the lobby and entered the elevator. I rolled up to her expensive suite, my head in the clouds. My brief knock was answered immediately. When I stepped into the large apartment, I froze instantly. There were two white men standing there, and police was written all across their faces. Janet closed the door slowly behind me. Here is Mr. Jones now, she said in a low voice. I looked at her, and there was shock written all across her face. The first thing that flashed across my mind was that she had found out where I had gotten the 20,000 big ones at. 
How the hell had Stella found out so quick where I had gone? I cursed silently. I have to play it by ear until I found out how much they knew. Horse son, she blurted out. They want you on another pandering case. Tears welled up in her eyes. At the mention of another, both policemen glanced quickly at each other. It's not pandering we want you for, Mr. Jones, one of the well-dressed young men said. He flashed his badge at me. We are federal officers, and we want you for transporting prostitutes across state lines. I was stunned. For a minute, I couldn't believe what they were saying. I grinned. I knew they had me wrong. I hadn't brought any whores here, but boots. Boots! Boots! The name exploded in my mind. What had that bitch done to me? The smile slowly disappeared as I was beginning to get a glimmer of what had happened. We have the statement of a young lady who says you brought her here with you from Detroit. Is that correct? The younger of the two men asked. I could only nod my head. I just gave her a ride. That's all, I said, more for Janet's benefit than for any other reason. She was staring at me in horror. She put her hand over her mouth to hold back a sob. Oh, Horson, Horson, why? You didn't need the money, she screamed and ran towards her bedroom. God damn, I cursed. The bitch believed me guilty already. She hadn't even bothered to ask me if it was true or not. You better come downtown with us, Mr. Jones, one of the officers said. I must advise you that anything you say now may be used against you. I turned silently and followed them to the door. Janet, I yelled back across my shoulder. Call me up a lawyer, baby. At least wait until you know what's really happening before falling apart on me. It was a sickening ride downtown. I sat in the back seat and remained silent. When we got to the federal building, the two officers put me between them and led me inside. They took me somewhere on the third floor and put me in an office. I sat there for about ten minutes until a fat, round-faced white man came in. He smiled at me. My name is Mr. Lopdaw, Mr. Jones, and I'm the man assigned to your case. Before you say anything, I want you to know that whatever you say might be held against you. He sat down. Now that we've got that bullshit done with, we can get down to business. He lit a cigarette and offered me one. I guess you know we have got you by your balls. I don't know a goddamn thing, I snarled angrily. You got some kind of fucking statement by some silly ass bitch, and you think I'm supposed to confess? I glared at him. You can take that statement and shove it up that bitch's ass for all I give a fucking fuck. The smile came off his face. His eyes glittered dangerously. Well, now that we understand each other a little better, horse son, he dragged the name out, we can lay all the cards on the table. I not only have you by the balls, boy, but if you give me any bullshit, I will personally see that we rack your ass up. Screw you and that bitch, I replied hotly. I didn't give a damn what he said. I wasn't planning on copping out. He took another approach. You seem like a pretty bright kid, son, so let's look at what you're up against. First of all, we do have that lady's statement. Now, I'll admit you could fight it, but here's what kills your shit. We got your record, boy, and we know for a fact that this woman was your whore. You went to prison in 1957. After doing six years and three months, you were released. He smiled at me coldly. How do you think a jury will react when they find out that this same woman who went to prison with you as your rap partner is now pressing charges on you for the man act? Do you really believe they'll find you innocent? I stared at him, too shocked to speak. Up until now, I had still believed I would be able to walk out of here and return to my bright future. His last words had brought my small world tumbling down around my head. He stared at me for a few seconds, then dropped the crusher on me. Don't think this is your only problem. It seems as if this young lady really wants your ass. 
I stared at him in surprise. I couldn't think of anything else she could do. She didn't know anything about the 20 grand I had ripped off, thank God. She happens to be pressing pandering charges against you with the state of New York. You could get 10 to 15 for that alone, not counting the time we're going to give you. I slumped down in the chair. I felt as though someone had beaten me with an iron pipe. If you have ever been in a fight and it continued until you couldn't hold up your arms, you have an idea of what I'm talking about. I just wanted to lie down somewhere. I couldn't even think any longer. I stared at the officer, defeated. I knew I was finished. If I got time from the state, then got sentenced by the government, they could run the time wild. What I mean by that is, after you finish doing 10 years for the state, the feds will be waiting for you. They will pick you up at one prison and transport you right back to another one to start the second sentence. I guess you realize that if we wanted to, we can run your two sentences wild, he said. I could hear his voice coming to me as though we were miles apart. We don't want to give you the short end of the stick, though, Mr. Jones. I have already talked to the detectives on your case, and they have agreed to drop the charges against you if you will plead guilty to the federal charge. I came awake then, as if someone had poured cold water on me. In the past ten minutes, I had accepted the fact that I was going to prison. Now, we were bargaining on how many years of my life I would have to spend there. How much time would I get if I pleaded guilty? I asked hoarsely. He tapped his fingers on the edge of his desk, watching me closely. I can almost promise you, off the record of course, that you won't get over five years in prison. I smiled for the first time since entering his office. Five years wasn't too bad. I'd still be in my twenties when I got out, even if I had to do all five. It would be damn near 1970 by the time I got out, but that was better than a lot of people I knew. There were some men who would never get out. You just made yourself a deal, Mr. Lopdahl, I said as I leaned across the desk and shook his hand. Then I sat back in the chair and started to plan my future. It wouldn't pay to make bond because if my picture got in the paper again and Stella came across it, I'd have another case to fight. No. The best course would be to lie in the jail and wait for sentence. After that, I'd have no problem, except doing the time. They carried me across the street and locked me up in the bullpen. I ignored the five men who were there when I arrived. From parts of their conversation, I gathered that the three young Negroes had been caught up trying to hold up a bank. The two older men, both Italians, sat huddled together, speaking in low tones. I sat down on the end of the bench, away from the others. It was a bitter pill I had to swallow. Another meatball. Here I was going back to prison again for something I didn't even do. Technically, I had been innocent the first time. I hadn't received a dime from that particular prostitute, but I had been sent to prison nevertheless. The very thought of it was so ironic that I tossed my head back and laughed. The men inside the bullpen stopped gossiping and stared at me curiously. My laughter carried the sound of all the bitterness and loneliness I had experienced in my short existence. Mockery was the answer to my stupidity, for what else could I call it? Not cleverness. What could be clever about a man who wasted over ten years of his life behind prison walls? By the time I got out, I'd have over ten years in, and for what? $20,000? A man working at a car wash will make more than that over a 10-year span. Mr. Jones, Horson Jones, are you back there? The voice came from the cell door. I got up and made my way over to the door. You're Mr. Jones, the elderly man asked me as soon as I reached the bars. Before I could answer, he held out a small white card. I'm Mr. Weinstein, he said. Miss Wilson had given me a retainer to handle your case for you. The mention of Janet's name filled me with warmth. I couldn't think of anything I need right now more than a lawyer, I replied and smiled at him. He grinned in return. Good. As soon as they take you over for arraignment, we'll have you out on bond. I shook my head. I don't want any bond, Mr. Weinstein. As far as I'm concerned, I don't think I've got a chance of beating this case. He scratched his small, graying mustache. You haven't made a statement yet, have you? He asked quickly. No, I answered, then continued to explain why I believe my best chance will be to plead guilty. 
He remained silent for a few seconds. If that's the case, you had better work it like that. I can see how they got you. We would never be able to break down her testimony once they revealed both of your records. No doubt about it, they're going to find you guilty. He hesitated briefly. You can still make bond though. You might as well have a few months on the street. I shook my head. For every day I do in jail, waiting to go to trial. When I get sentenced, it will come off my prison sentence. Isn't that correct? I asked, not bothering to give him the real reason why I didn't want to get out. Oh yes, you'll get every day you spend in jail. I can guarantee you that you'll get that even if you don't want me as your lawyer. Oh yes, I want you, I replied. In fact, if you'll make the proper arrangements, I'll see to it that you get your money today. That's not necessary, he answered quickly. Miss Wilson gave me $1,000 as a retainer and informed me that money was not the problem. She said to tell you that she would handle the financial end of it. In fact, he continued, she's waiting down the hall. I'll try and see if she can get back here for a few minutes when I leave. I'll see you in court then, I said abruptly. I knew as well as he did that I didn't really need a lawyer. It was all a matter of show. You were supposed to have one. If you didn't, the courts would just appoint you one. He turned and walked away. I clutched the bars tightly as I waited for Janet's appearance. I could hear her heels clicking as she came down the hallway. I waited with my heart thumping loudly until she came into view. She covered my hands on the bars with hers. I could see the circles under her eyes from where she had been crying. Hi, she managed to say with a forced grin. Hi, baby. I couldn't think of anything to say. Just to stand there and look at her was enough for me. I talked to the lawyer, Horson. He says you're going to have to plead guilty. I don't understand. Listen, baby, I said and stared at her earnestly. I ain't going to try and give you no bullshit. You know that me and Boots ain't been together ever since Tony copped her while I was in prison, don't you? She shook her head in reply. I ain't got no reason to lie to you, Janet, so this is the truth, baby. I gathered up my wits and began to lie fluently. Before I left Detroit, baby, I saw Boots and told her I was leaving. Now, she wanted to get away from Tony, so I told her I would take her with me. I didn't say anything about us going back together, honey, but I will admit that we stopped on the highway and checked into a motel and had sex. I don't know if she got the idea in her head that I wanted her, but when we reached New York, I paid for her hotel room and gave her $50 to make it with. Then, I stepped out of her life. I watched her closely to see if she was going for it. Her eyes were large and she stared at me with complete sincerity. I believe you, honey. I really do. Maybe she was just mad about us getting together. She dropped her head and muttered quietly. I can't help myself anyway, whore son. I missed my period. For a minute, her words didn't ring a bell with me. Then it came to me like a flash. What, baby? Are you sure? I wanted to pull the bars down and take her in my arms. Two of the young brothers came up to the bars and stared over my shoulder at Janet. I could hear them talking amongst themselves as they walked back to give me some privacy. The third one walked over to make sure, and I could hear them exclaiming that it was Janet Wilson, the singer. She shook her head and smiled up at me. If I am pregnant, the baby has to have a name, Horson. I mean, I'm not going to bring any children into this world without a father. See the lawyer, baby, I said happily. We can arrange it so we can have a quiet marriage in the jail. We won't be able to have a honeymoon for at least three or four years, but when we do, it will be beautiful. That's all for now, miss, the guard said quietly as he walked up. We'll be taking them over to the courtroom shortly, so if you want to see him again, I advise you to wait over there. I watched her walk away. She glanced back over her shoulder, and I managed to get my hand through the bars far enough to wave. As I watched her leave, it didn't disturb me any longer that I was on my way back to prison. That was the way the cookie crumbled. I had played the game, and now I had to pay the dues. 
There were no more tears of frustration in the back of my eyes because I knew I would not do this time alone. I had a woman who would be there right with me, writing and visiting until I came home. And now I knew there would be a real home somewhere in my future, a house full of love. The many lonely nights that were before me wouldn't be lonely anymore. There would be no need to reach down inside myself in the darkness, seeking strength, fighting back the tears of loneliness and despair as I told myself that a man didn't cry. The stark reality of the bars and gray walls that would be part of my life for the next few years held no fear. If Janet had me a boy child, how beautiful the world would be. He would never have to experience the poverty and vice of the slums. I bit my lip as I tried to remember the old toast an old con had once told me. It fitted me to a T. The jungle creed said the strong must feed on any prey at hand. I was branded a beast and sat at the feast before I was a man. Yes, that was it. And that had been my problem. I had been introduced to too much game at too young an age. As I stared through the bars, I began to see myself more clearly. In the past four hours, I had finally grown up. I knew now that I'd never again put myself in the position where a woman could send me to prison on a whim. Not again in this lifetime. I knew where I was going now. Maybe I didn't know when I'd get out, but whenever I did, there would be another way of life waiting on me. One, I didn't know anything about except that there would be truthfulness between me and my woman and deceit would be a thing of the past. I smiled at the thought. I had a lot to learn, but I had a lot of time to learn it in. I glanced at the three young boys huddled together on the bench. They were young and wild and life had been unkind to them. Maybe one of them would find his way while in prison to a life from vice and corruption and most of all, away from the streets of broken dreams. We have reached the conclusion of this mini-series on Ralph Reed's. I would like to thank you queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may connect with me on Twitter and Instagram, as well as Periscope at RGMC2407. Drop me an email at RGMC2407 at gmail.com, where you may leave a small donation via Zelle or paypal.me forward slash RGMC2407 or the Cash App. My cash tag is RGMC2407. You may also find me on my very own channel, RGMC, Ralph Garcia, Master of Ceremonies, as well as right here at home on the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you and love you like cooked food. I will see you folks on the next edition of Ralph Reed's Schlaplecker.